my name is Henry Palacci. I just graduated from Columbia University, and today I'm going to very humbly talk about um, some points of convergence between uh, physics and machine learning. Uh, so this is really old stuff. Uh, it's been, I mean, these um, common points have been around since the 90s with really uh, prestigious researchers. Uh, so I'm really going to only show you the very beginning of a very small slice of um, uh, the research I did during my PhD. Uh, I'm going to start by talking more about deep learning and machine learning very quickly, uh, and then we're going to completely shift uh, to uh, physics and more specifically statistical mechanics, and I'm going to end by uh, showing you um, how statistical mechanics, statistical physics, and machine learning are kind of the same in some points. All right, let's get started. So um, deep learning is, uh, and some of you might groan at this, is the state of the art for uh, speech recognition and generation, language recognition and understanding, image and video processing, and decision making in controlled environments, in very controlled environments, such as games. Um, so we'll all agree that deep learning is useful. That said, deep learning has uh, a pretty, uh, uh, grave limitations. Uh, deep learning algorithms are black boxes. Uh, they're completely uh, uninterpretable. Um, they can't identify unusual data. And what I mean by that is, um, let's say you train your algorithm on a specific training data set, and all of a sudden you deploy it in the real world, and then um, some data points come in that don't look at all like your training data set. Um, your algorithm is still going to make predictions as if nothing was, was wrong. Um, so it's not going to be able to tell you that it doesn't recognize that kind of data. And more importantly, for someone with a statistics background like me, there is no notion of error, bound, or error bounds. The predictions are what they are. You can't draw error bars, which drives me crazy, um, and which can pr prove to be really, really problematic. Um, if you're using deep learning for ad recommendation or uh, to play Go, if you're making a mistake, it's not that bad. But when you're moving to more serious applications, like healthcare, like self-driving cars, it's really, really important to be able to um, have those error bars. Another um, limitation or theoretical um, mystery, I would say, is that we don't really understand that well um, why deep learning works so well. So this is the uh, traditional uh, bias variance graph, uh, where the blue curve represents your training error as a function of model, co model complexity. So as you add layers to your models, or as you make your layers wider and wider, um, your training error is just kind of always going to go down and down and down. But at some point, you're going to start memorizing there's an example in overfitting and then um, your validation error is going to go up, and you're going to start overfitting. Um, on this curve, uh, deep learning is kind of an outlier. Um, deep learning models are really, really complex. They can have parameters that are sometimes um, have, be, have be of higher dimensions than uh, your data set itself. And still, uh, you, you get kind of an implicit regularization. Uh, the validation error can still be very low. Um, I would really recommend you take a look at this uh, uh, rethinking generalization paper, which talks about this in, a, in depth. So to set the stage, uh, <laughs> a, a, a normal classification problem, uh, you're trying to identify if uh, an image is a dog or a mop. Uh, you have your data x1, xm, which is in this case uh, a dog or a mop, and then your labels dog and mop. And we'll consider your, our deep net as just a kind of parametric function model, uh, which takes as input the data, xi, and then the weights or the parameters, w. And model returns either, in this case, dog or mop. What we want to do is learn the weights so your model behaves well. Um, we can learn the weights, w, by minimizing a loss function on, on training data. How do we do that? Um, the workhorse algorithm is stochastic gradient descent and all its variants. Um, so you compute the gradient of the loss, and then you take, you take a small step uh, in the opposite direction. So the update step looks like this. Um, the, your new weights are equal to their previous weights minus your lear learning rate lambda times the gradient of the loss. And that looks like this. And what this does is it gives you a minimum. But it gives you one minimum. It gives you one set of points, W minimum. 
And Bayesian deep learning, and again, the Bayesians among you might groan at this, um, is switching from this one point for the best parameters for your neural network to a distribution for your neural network. You're switching from one point and you're widening this to a distribution. What is the right distribution of the weights that still fits my training data? If we had this probability distribution for W, we would have error bars because we would be able to have several models with their different probabilities and average those. Um, this would help reduce overfitting because there's, there's a less likely chance that we would get stuck in a very deep local minimum. And it may help detect unusual data because now you have a way to quantify uncertainty. Okay, so that's Bayesian deep learning in one slide. So now I want to talk about statistical mechanics and completely switch gears. Statistical mechanics is um, uh, uh, one of the major pillars of physics. Um, it deals with small systems that have randomness in them. So here, this is a video, it, it's not very impressive, I know, um, of uh, milk fat droplets in water. And they're not static, they move around um, with motion that's called Brownian motion. Um, these physics are so important. Uh, they're not at all covered by the mainstream media and they're really, the incredible result in physics right now in statistical mechanics that are completely overlooked um, because of quantum mechanics, I guess. Um, <laughs> um, but why this is so important is that if you think about, you want to understand how a cell works. A cell is like this. It's, it's, uh, it's water with really, really small proteins moving in it, and they have this random motion. And all the uh, current advancements in biophysics are using statistical mechanics to uh, prove really incredible results. So I'll try to uh, give you an overview of statistical mechanics really briefly. Um, just generally in physics, um, the particles that are subject to this random motion in, in, in any object really um, is going to be driven to lower energy states by a force. So the force is going to be minus the gradient of energy and you can see this as uh, putting a marble in a bowl and the marble is going to roll around until it comes to the lowest energy state which is the bottom of the bowl. Another really important force when you have randomness is um, this combinatorial force. Um, your system of particles is going to be driven to the most frequently occurring um, configurations. So if you look at this box with a bunch of particles that I drew, um, <clears throat> if, you, if you look at the configuration on the left uh, and you compare it to the configuration on the right, you may be a little more surprised if the particles are moving around to see all the particles bunched up in the corner like that, but this might seem more likely. Um, and it's maybe not completely obvious in this drawing, but like imagine all the air molecules in this room. Uh, they're pretty uniformly distributed and they are constantly moving around. How likely would it be that all the air molecules would be in the corner of this room bunched up? Pretty unlikely. Um, and that's just because there's more ways for the particles to be uniformly distributed than being in the corner of the room. There's nothing mysterious about it. It's just you count the ways that you can organize those particles. There's just more ways for them to be uniformly, semi-uniformly distributed than in the corner of the room. So let's think about um, water in a pot. So these are your water molecules in a pot and you turn on the flame, flame below the pot. And water molecules like to be next to each other. Um, and as you, as, the, as you turn the flame higher and higher, um, you're increasing the randomness, you're increasing the temperature, and this force that kind of like binds them together um, is increasingly um, dominated by this random force, this agitation, and all of a sudden your water evaporates um, and occupies your entire room. So there's really, that's what statistical mechanics is about. It's about this balance of these two forces. So to recap, uh, your particles are gonna be driven to lower energy states. You're gonna minimize your energy and they're gonna be driven to the more frequently occurring configurations. Nothing mysterious about it, just your counting. Um, and we write that in physics as the max of the log of the number of configurations. And this log of number of configurations, you've all heard of it under way more mysterious uh, pretenses. Um, it's none other than the entropy. That's what entropy is. Um, it's the log of the number of configurations. It's on Boltzmann's grave. <clears throat> and as we saw in the previous video, it looks like there's a knob that's gonna 
le make us lean towards the energy side or towards the entropy side, and it's linked to how high that flame is under your pot. The dial between these two forces is the temperature. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna minimize the energy minus the temperature times the entropy. If the temperature is zero, the energy term is the one that dominates. Uh, the particles are gonna be stuck together. And if you increase your temperature, the entropy term is gonna start dominating more and more and lead to water kind of occupying the entire kitchen. Um, that's, uh, these are the fundamental concepts of statistical mechanics. And, um, if you kind of like understand that, you understand a lot more than most uh, uh, thermodynamics undergrads. <laughs> you can do a little math uh, on this on, under various con conditions. And uh, this is where the machine learning people here are gonna start having their bells ring. Um, if you do this, uh, you can calculate the probability of a given con configuration W as being the exponential of minus the energy of that configuration divided by the temperature. Um, divided by some normalization constant, which is really important, but we won't talk about it. Um, <coughs> and y you might recognize this as being the softmax function. And that is also the Boltzmann distribution in statistical mechanics. And it makes a lot of sense that um, the, the configurations with the lowest energy are gonna be the most probable, and the width of this distribution is gonna be controlled by that temperature term. A way to simulate this in physics, a way to understand this is using Langevin dynamics. There's a lot of other ways to go about doing this, but the one we're gonna talk about is Langevin dynamics. And Langevin dynamics in physics um, is a, an update rule for uh, your, the positions and velocities, the positions of your particles, where um, your parameters at uh, step t plus dt is equal to the parameters at the previous step minus some force term plus some mysterious normalizing factor times noise. So all you're, at, all you're doing is at each step, you're adding square root of the size of your step times the temperature times noise. And that's the launch of dynamics. And if, if you simulate particles, and that's what I did on those videos where you see the particles moving, I use launch of dynamics and it's used all the time um, in physics to simulate complex systems. Um, then you get the, the, this, this nice probabilistic distribution. So of course, and now the, the leap to machine learning and deep learning becomes pretty obvious, right? Um, the state of the particles in statistical physics is gonna be e equivalent to the parameters in statistical learning. The energy um, in uh, physics is gonna be equivalent to the loss. You're moving to a lower energy you want to move to a lower loss. And this relaxation to equilibrium where you start with a random state with a marble on, on near the wall of the bowl um, is in finish at the bottom of the bowl is going to be equivalent to loss minimiz minimization in statistical learning. And another one that's a little uh, bit um, uh, more iffy is the maximum entropy principle. Um, it's beyond the scope of this talk and we can talk about it uh, after if you want. And it's a little iffy. There's no real correspondence there. So remember our stochastic gradient descent update where the weights were updated by the learning rate times the gradient of the loss. Well, you can just do launch of on dynamics on that too, um, where you update your weight and then you have the learning rate times the gradient of the loss, which is stochastic gradient descent. And then you add the scaling term square root of the learning rate times Gaussian noise. And at this point, it seems almost trivial that you can do that. Um, and that's a paper from Welling and Tay in 2011. And this is a way to prevent, uh, so you remember that graph where um, your, your parameters went to the lowest of the energy. By adding noise at every step, you're preventing it from collapsing it to a minimum and you're getting a distribution instead of getting to a minimum. So <clears throat> this is where um, during my undergrad in 2001, uh, this would have been um, months of C++. Uh, but thanks to uh, the Python, the scientific Python community, testing those ideas, it, it becomes unbelievably easy. Um, I remember when I, when I read that paper and I'm like, okay, I'm gonna implement it. And you know, I was talking to my advisor and said, well, it's probably gonna take a week um, to implement it. And I opened the PyTorch repo and I start looking at the code <clears throat> and I had it finished in 20 minutes. Um, and, and it's not because I'm really good at programming, I'm not. Um, 
It's just because it's really easy. So this is two lines from the PyTorch repo where um, it's the only thing you need to understand from, from stochastic gradient this descent is P is your parameters and you're taking your gradient and putting in a DP, which makes a lot of sense. And then to P, you're adding the learning rate uh, time minus the learning rate times the gradient. That's stochastic gradient descent um, in PyTorch. So it's in this file, you can take a look at, I've linked to it too. Uh, in my repo. Um, there's a lot of other stuff, but it's 100 lines of code. It's really, really readable. And, and having this ability to modify state-of-the-art code uh, to make it yourself, I think, is a superpower in science right now. Um, and so if you want to do stochastic gradient uh, launch event dynamics, uh, you add one, I guess, one and a half line of codes. You cal calculate, you determine launch event noise as a normal, uh, Gaussian variable, and then instead of adding um, the gradient, you add noise and you properly scale it. And that's it. And that's why it took me 20 minutes, and that's pretty long for these one and a half lines of codes already. Um, <clears throat> and so you can, you can test those ideas really, really quickly. Um, I'm going to show you, I'm going to briefly, briefly show you some results uh, of what, what, how this is useful in real life. Um, so you've, you've all seen the MNIST data set. It has 60,000 training images and 10,000 test images, and you can trade in convolutional neural network, like in all the tutorials out there, um, to recognize those, those digits. And what I was concerned with is the unusual data problem. What happens uh, if you take your convolutional neural network and instead of feeding it numbers, you start feeding it something that doesn't look at all like that data? Um, so I found this uh, cool data cell called not NIST by Yaroslav Bulatov, uh, which is instead of being numbers are just letters. So it's A, B, C, D, E, F, G, I think, or maybe it goes to H. Uh, it has 20,000 images. They're scaled like NIST. They're available online. Um, and you can look at what happens when you use your uh, pre-trained convolutional network on not NIST. So this is what I call out-of-sample image detection. So that's maybe not the most obvious graph to read, but this is your normal uh, stochastic uh, gradient descent in blue. And the yellow one is Langevin stochastic gradient descent. And this is the distribution of the confidence in predictions. So there's a weird normalization effect, but if, in a nutshell, if you use stochastic gradient descent and you feed it, not NIST, what you really, really want is that the probability of the most likely label to be really low. You want it to say, I don't really know what this is. But it doesn't do that. It gives you relatively high probabilities. As you can see, most of them are above 80%. But all of a sudden, you add the launch of noise to that, and you average those models, and you get an unbelievable shift in that distribution, where now the probabilities on not NIST are around 10%, are centered around 10%. So I felt that was a really strong um, result for uh, Bayesian neural networks, um, that you can use them to kind of like give you the uncertainty on this out of sample image detection. There's a lot of caveats to that. It doesn't really work on all the data set, but it does really work uh, well here. Uh, well, um, that's uh, pretty much all I had for today, um, but um, it's a really, really quick introduction. And as I said at the beginning, um, this field, the interaction with machine, machine learning and statistical physics is extremely rich. And there's a lot of things that are happening in, in theoretical statistical physics right now um, that could be used in machine learning. So if you're a machine learning researcher, um, it's worth looking at thermodynamics of information, uh, the link between statistical me mechanics and information theory. The, there's unbelievable progress that's being done right now that's not at all covered by the press. Um, so I have this repo with uh, um, a little launch of a dynamic package. Um, but I also added in the readme, I added the links to this slide. I added the links to uh, three blog posts I wrote that are, go a little more in depth. Um, I added a link to a paper that kind of like shows the different ways that you can do uh, stochastic, stochastic gradient launch of dynamics. So which I would really encourage you to uh, check it out. It's on my repo and it's called SGLD. Um, 
yeah, uh, thank you so much for listening, and I'm happy to take any questions. All right, uh, we've got about five minutes for questions, so we can certainly manage a few. Remember, one question per person, phrase in the form of a question, and we'd like to take a question from a woman first, if possible. So. Yeah, uh, thanks for showing the false positive curve. Uh, I'm assuming you've done the first false negative. Uh, by running the nest itself, uh, the actual images, and see yep. it didn't reduce them? Reduce it, the didn't, it didn't reduce them. Okay. So it, perfor it performs very similarly to um, um, stochastic gradient descent. Uh, I, if, you, if you look at our, uh, our, ICM, uh, our ICML workshop paper, uh, we have a really pretty in-depth comparison that shows also um, the, the positives. Yeah. Um, so I'm not sure if I got the gist clearly, but are you saying that um, it's not the actual prediction that's different, but you're actually coming up with a different set of weights and that's giving you a lower confidence in the out-of-sample images? So, yeah, so that's kind of, I kind of hit that in, in the talk. What, what you're really getting is you're, you're, you're getting a lot of set, uh, you're not getting one set of weights, you're getting several set of weights because you're sampling from that distribution. That's really what you're doing. It's kind of like a weird Monte Carlo. Um, and so that allows you to have better un uncertainty, like a way to quantify uncertainty that's different than just using that soft max vector. Is it, is it so, so the actual training is not harder because you're just adding that noise. Uh, it's a little bit slower than SGD because you're adding noise. Um, where, it's, where it's a little more computationally expensive is that instead of uh, running one inference, you're running inference with several set of weights. Um, so at inference time, it is a little more computationally expensive, but usually that's not the limitation in deep learning um, today. Okay. <laughs> Yay. Great talk, thank you. Thank um, you. How, in, this, in, in Bayesian deep learning, how do you incorporate prior knowledge? Like in, in your NIST and your MNIST and not MNIST example, like if you know that digits are millions of times more common than the letter G. How would you encode that? Yeah, that's, that's a really cool, good question because, of course, like I described Bayesian neural, neural networks as being neural networks with uncertainty in the weights, and obviously that's, there's a lot of other stuff going on in uh, Bayesian statistics. And one thing that you can do is incorporate uh, prior knowledge in the weights. The one, the one, and you're touching on a really uh, sensitive point here, is that when, when you think of Bayesian um, models, you're thinking of graphical models where the priors mean something, where you can use informed priors um, according to your expert knowledge. Here, the prior is the prior on the weights. And I, I don't know how to express correctly um, expert knowledge on the weights. So here the prior information is just trying to be as least informative as you can. Um, and in this case, I just use normal initialization type uh, uncertainty on the, in the, on the weights. So there might be a way to do that. Um, it's just not straightforward. Um, yeah, uh, regarding the output, um, you had the confidence <clears throat> or some uh, the binomial um, probability model, uh, model output and we saw that one of uh, you know the or original one had a very high confidence, and your Bayesian output had a very low confidence. Um, I mean, the Bayesian usually just uh, provides you the uh, the you know kind of probabilistic sense of your output, like in terms of distribution or dispersion. But your CS just uh, simply giving very poor output, not giving the you know the probabilistic sense of uh, your output. It, isn't it just uh, the result of uh, poor uh, training? Just, uh, simply, I don't see any uh, benefits coming out from Bayesian. Well, it, it, if, if, so yeah, I, I should have shown that 
the, the Bayesian algorithm performs just as well, if not better, on MNIST itself. Uh, and in terms of confidence on MNIST itself, the, conf the confidence are very high. So it's just not that I'm kind of like training the network badly. They're trained to the same level of accuracy and confidence on MNIST itself. And you only see the difference when you n use the not MNIST data, not when you use the MNIST data. Um, so it, that's really where you see that, uh, that the, the power of this approach. All right, uh, thank you very much. And let's all thank Henri again for a Thank you so much. Talk. Thank you.